Uh, keep your socks on, you'll be all right. Uh, there, over the last couple of years, there's been quite a little information in the press about traumatic brain injury. Most of it related to reports on ex-football players who, as a consequence of repeated hits to the head, have become depressed, oftentimes homeless, and then commit suicide. And it's probably good that there's some attention being brought to this problem, although it should be pointed out right off the bat that the uh, football players or the athletes are not the, the major uh, targets for this disease. There are about a one and a half to two million cases a year in this country of traumatic brain injury, 50,000 deaths, 80,000 disabled. In the military, there are another 300,000. That doesn't include people in the VA. But the leading causes are not athletic injuries. They're by far and away, the leading causes are accidents, uh, falling off your bicycle or falling off the roof or whatever it might be. Interestingly enough, assaults come in second, domestic assaults, and then athletics. There are two types of traumatic brain injury. The experts say that these are separate diseases. I'm not convinced of it. But the, there are acute and chronic uh, forms of traumatic brain injury. And as indicated on the slide, uh, the acute is, are injuries such as, as uh, concussions, head bumps. They don't have to be associated with any period of unconsciousness. They heal rapidly and spontaneously. But multiple injuries of this sort can lead to problems later on. And it, are, it, are, it is these acute for these acute injuries that are the focus of most of the research being done now, both in this country and otherwise, and we'll see in a minute why that is. In contrast, the chronic form of traumatic brain injury is a result of multiple insults or sometimes just one really serious one. And I have these first couple or three dot points just as an example of different forms of injuries resulting in chronic traumatic brain injury. The first is one of the patients in our group who was a, a, a Hall of Fame lineman in the FN, NFL. He's up there because he's all being, also being studied by a team from UCLA. And the group at UCLA is not doing anything therapeutically for this fellow like we are, but what they're doing is, is following the morphology of his brain over time, seeing how it changes, and see if they can relate changes into the, in morphology to uh, function. But what's interesting about his situation is that as a prelude to starting the, the um, UCLA study, the investigators there did some calculations to find out just how often did this guy get hit in his career. And it ended up over 250,000 times. This is from Pee Wee football till, until his um, retirement from the NFL. So that's, that's really repeated injury. The, the next dot point there is a physician who was in a, an auto accident, not able to practice medicine anymore as a consequence of the accident. We're getting him back to where I think he'll be able to do that again. But again, one serious accident, he's in trouble. And we'll come back to these, these guys in a, in a few minutes. The third one is another physician who uh, was riding her horse one day. The horse reared up, threw her off. She landed on her head, and uh, that was it for her. Now, the problem, and one of the re a couple of the reasons why there is less work being done with the chronic form of disease than the acute, is that there are no biomarkers for the chronic form. There's nothing you can look at in the serum, the blood, urine, or anything of that sort to get an idea of disease progression or stability or alterations as a consequence of therapy. And likewise, there are no standard, standardized uh, animal models, which, again, for investigators make things, makes things a little bit tougher. So just a nutshell summary of what we're doing for these patients is we're using an oxidized form of um, streptolysin O. And streptolysin O is a toxin that's produced by group A beta hemolytic streptococci. That's a mouthful. But that's the strep that causes strep throat. And it's this exotoxin that causes the pain of strep throat. We oxidize it so it's no longer toxic, and it has some absolutely unique uh, biological activities as a consequence of the oxidation. We've used it anecdotally and in a couple controlled studies clinically to treat a wide variety of scars, everything from 
idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis to cardiomyopathy, uh, polycystic kidneys, acne scars, adhesions, um, trauma-induced scars, and so forth. And these are all collagen-related problems, and we know that the SLO, our product, is a potent uh, product for regulating collagen deposition. It's also a potent anti-inflammatory agent. We'll see why that's important. It also down-regulates MMP9, which doesn't mean a whole lot to most people, I suspect. But that is a gene that produces a protein that is associated with a wide variety of chronic disorders. And over the last eight or nine years, over $7 billion has been spent by the pharmaceutical industry to find products that down-regulate that gene. There are several of those products that have come to phase three trials. They're all toxic. Uh, this one is not. Uh, we know that SLO acts as a very potent signal to inhibit scar formation in an acute scar, in an acute situation. Uh, so if you get a, a bad cut, for example, take SLO sublingually or even rub it on, a scar will not form. Instead, there'll be a stimulation of what are called keratinocytes that will move into the wound. You'll heal without a scar. In old wounds, the SLO upsets the balance between collagen, which is the scar tissue, and collagenase, which is a, an enzyme that breaks down collagen. And that imbalance goes in favor of collagenase. So it starts to break down old scars, and that old scar is replaced by more vital tissue. So we know the SLO acts on both internal and external scars. We didn't know if it would work on traumatic brain injury because there's no collagen in the scars in the brain. Completely different system. We did this little study with some investigators at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital. This is a, uh, their model. It's a, it's a standardized uh, mouse model for looking at acute traumatic brain injury. And what happens here, if I can find this, whoops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's get back to where we belong and see if I can find this little dot. There, whoops, there we go. Um, what we do is put animals in a restrainer and uh, hit them on the head with a pneumatic punch. And you can measure the, the strength of the punch and the location. Uh, wonderful technology. Um, the sham animals, geez, oh man. The, uh, <laughs> the sham animals, I'm not going to use the pointer anymore. The sham animals are put into the restrainer but are not injured. The next group, the middle group, uh, the, the CHI is just in the uh, strain of mouse. Those animals are put into the restrainer, are bopped once in the head, and then they are treated with the vehicle, which is uh, PBS, phosphate buffered saline. The third group, punched in the head in the restrainer and treated with SLO. And then what we want to do is measure memory loss and ability to recover short-term memory. So what you're seeing here, again, without the pointer, that bottommost line, as the green indicates, are the sham controls. And you can see that one day after the injury, it takes them about 27 or 28 seconds to find a submerged island in a little pond that they will swim to and stand on to get out of the water so they can breathe easily. All right, so that's the idea. Then every day for five days, they're put back in the pond. And what you're measuring is how long does it take for them to find the island. And you can see that by day five, they're down to five or six seconds. They found the spot. Their short-term memory is, is great. That's the control that had no injury. The next line is the black one that goes up and down. Those are the uh, animals that are injured and then treated with just the vehicle. You can see that the injury causes an incredible increase in length of time on day one to find that island. They're up at around 47, 48 seconds. They do very nicely in day two. They come down to about half the time, but they don't get any better. That's as, that's as good as it's going to get. And then the treated animals, you can see the, the animals treated with SLO uh, come down to, by day five, they're starting to come pretty close back to altogether normal. If we euthanize those animals, take their brains out, well, I'm not going to spend time on any portion of this slide except the bottom right-hand corner. This is extremely important. Microglia cells are cells in the brain that on injury start to infiltrate into the area of injury. And I'll tell you what that means in a second, but you can see, well, we'll try this one last time. There we go. You can see that microglia infiltration is a great deal greater in the animals that were treated with just the phosphate buffered saline than in either the sham controls or those that were treated with SLO. 
The significance of that is the microglia are the predecessors to inflammation. And inflammation is the predecessor to scarring. Scarring in the brain is going to be in the form of gliosis rather than collagen, but the fundamental situation is the same. And this, uh, you can't see quite as much as you might like, but the idea here is that we're looking at a marker for microglia cells, and there are more of those cells in the sham controls, more of these, these bright points or dark points than there are in either the sham or the SLO. Again, confirmation that SLO is inhibiting microglial infiltration and likewise is preventing scarring in the brain of these mice in the acute type of disease. Now, jump to the chronic situation, we've got more of a problem. Again, there's no animal model. So what we have to do, uh, on, by the way, the third dot point, there are no biomarkers at all. So we have to focus on performance outcome. And we have done work with uh, humans that have been damaged for anywhere from a few months to a few decades. Here's the sort of thing we see. First, just looking at kind of a, an overview of athletes from different, uh, different types of sports that we've treated. And this is what we see. Usually within the first uh, couple weeks, we start to see improvement in terms of the headache, dizziness, and lightheadedness. You remember a few slides back, there was the one physician that got knocked off her horse and, and landed on her head. That gal had headaches 24-7, uh, starting immediately after the fall, lasting for five or six months before she started SLO therapy. And after the second day, she had no more headaches. She hasn't had any since. So some signs and symptoms respond very quickly, others not so, not so fast. Short-term memory improves better. The other physician that was mentioned in the previous slide, the one that was in a car accident, is no longer able to practice medicine, had really significant damage to short-term memory and into cognition and focus. That is all coming back now. This dot point way down here is perhaps the most important. All of the patients that have been treated with SLO, all of the chronically injured patients, show decreased emotional volatility. This is huge. They are able to control their emotions better. They are not lashing out. They don't get frustrated. They sleep better. The consequences of those sorts of things are that they now can hold jobs. They're going to get fired otherwise. Their interpersonal relationships are much better. They're not getting divorced. They can carry out normal activities of daily life without breaking windows or lashing out at their children or whatever might occur of that sort. Now, I would like to have the liberty of looking at what happens. We're just going to look at one patient, follow through with this one. This is a, a lady that was in a serious car accident 30 years before the start of SLO therapy. Okay? Serious accident to the extent that she needs 24-7 care from her family members. I picked this patient not because she's better or worse responder to, to our therapy, but because her father is a nice enough guy to send reports in about her every once in a while so we can follow what's going on. She was, by the way, 18 or 19 years old at the time of, at, of injury, so she's pushing 50 years old now. Here's what we're going to see. First report comes in 40 days after the start of SLO therapy. And look at the first thing the father said. She's calmer. That's just like the football players, the boxers, and all those. There's a decreased volatility of her emotions. That is very, very big deal. Now she can follow the, the stock reports on the TV, Shark Tank, which I'm not sure what that is, but I think it's a TV show, isn't it? Whatever it is, she can do it now, and she couldn't do it before. And she's reading more because of improved short-term memory just in 40 days. And understand, she went about 30 years without reading. And the reason for that is, at the bottom of the page, she couldn't remember what was at the top of the page. So just out of frustration, she quit reading. 70 days, first thing the father says again. She's calmer. She's now, for the first time, enjoying physical therapy. 106 days. Look down there, it says calmer again, more positive attitude, reading more. For the first time, she's taking care of herself. First time in 30 years that she's worried about her appearance. 141 days, look at that. This is really kind of fun. Of course, she's calmer again. We were not aware that she had had damage to her soft palate in this accident. And the consequence of that was 
that she had difficulty speaking and there was a great difficulty interpreting what she was saying. So it was hard for her to talk and uh, hard to understand what she was saying. We got this report about clear speech from her brother who hadn't seen her for about two and a half months. And the first thing he reported when the, the patient and her father arrived at the brother's house was, geez, what happened to your speech? And this is in a positive sort of way. 173 days, she can remember things. Now remember, she had a short-term memory compromise to the point that she couldn't remember top of the page to the bottom of the page. Now she can remember what she had for breakfast today and yesterday. Some of us couldn't do that. So that, that's a bit of a gain. She is commenting more, uh, and her comments are spontaneous, they're insightful, they're appropriate, and they are better articulated. So she's kind of pulling into society a little bit better. 260, look, it's still calmer. That is still a big deal in the father's estimation. This is very interesting about this improved organizational skills. She had an art therapist come in for his first session. After he left, she composed an email to him that said very simply, thank you very much for coming to my house. I appreciated your being here. We had fun. I look forward to your coming again. The big deal about this is that she was never before able to compose or send an email. So that's the organization skill we're talking about or that her father is talking about. And the sentence, that the father was nice enough to share the email with me. And it is really one that you would think would have been written by a, a uh, I don't know, seven or eight or nine year old. Very short sentences, short choppy subject verb, so, but you got the point across and that's brand new. And the kayaking and the water therapy are new to her and she initiated those with her friends. Nobody else did that. 289 days is the last report we have from her. This is about 40 days ago, so sometime in the next couple of weeks we'll hear another one or we'll receive another one. But look what's happened, still calmer, for some reason or other, she started planting a garden and watering it. And this business about doing chores around the house is interesting in the fact that without, pr without prompting and without being led to do them, she didn't do them before. Now she does them spontaneously. The father called me and said, you know what's really fun to see is for the first time ever, she put soap in the dishwashing machine. She couldn't do that before. So, conclusion. It looks like to us that SLO has some utility for both acute and chronic traumatic brain injury. We think this has a great deal of possibilities. Again, effects are seen in just a matter of a few days. In some cases, like the lady falling off her horse and having a headache, uh, other times it takes a little bit longer to see a response. That third dot point is really important. That is, healing continues, as we saw in this girl, for months. So it's not a matter of everything that heals and that's the end of it. Healing can go on for a long, long time. I suspect the next report from the father is going to show that there's further improvement in, in his daughter. And it doesn't matter how old the injuries are. This is a reversible disease. And thank goodness it's safe. To prove that, other than just anecdotally like this, we did do some animal studies and we put uh, by IV injection into rats seven consecutive days, SLO 5,000 times more concentrated than what these patients are getting, and no adverse responses. So what we're going to do, uh, we're raising money now to conduct some, former F some formal FDA trials. These are some of the parameters we'll measure in the patients in that are enrolled in the trial. We'll license the product out to some big company that'll screw it up somehow. And uh, with, but with any luck, we'll get it out to uh, the people that need it. And that's the end of that. So. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to give a try. Um, uh, a, a bit of a clarification, please. Do you, do you know when this fellow who's been writing all these reports uses the phrase, still calmer, does that mean even calmer than last time or just continuing to be calmer than in their pathological state. They reach a base which we would call normal. It's not as if they become comatose, uh, unresponsive or anything of that sort. Um, you had some very nice control data in the animal model. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, uh, in the patients, in the humans, 
uh, did you have any, any control data there? The placebo effect, which is a biological effect, I fully believe that, can be huge. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, patients or any cases where you've done this in a controlled manner, or have you used controls at all? No, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, in, the, in, our, in our experience with these patients, the patients have their own control. We have not done any placebo work because this is not an FDA study. We're just trying to treat patients and get them better. In the FDA study that we're proposing, there will be controls of the sort you're asking of. Yes, because I think that's an important caution here, because if the patients are their own control, uh, the placebo effect, uh, it, it's, I'm not saying it is the placebo effect, but we can't rule that out. You can't rule it out. It's a little unusual to have a placebo effect lasting 289 days. Um, that's a long placebo effect. It, it can happen. Uh, not to argue, uh, not too often. Yes, John, um, are you giving one initial dose or is there a dosage ongoing? They take a sublingual drop four times a day, one drop under the tongue four times a day. And have you done any imaging to... Um, no, no. We, we haven't had the funds to do that, but that's part of the proposed FDA trial. Thank you. In the streptococcus organism, the exotoxin before it's oxidized, is its purpose to that organism just to cause tissue damage so that it's more... Yep. Uh, infectious. That's what it does. Of all the compounds in all of biology, what made you think that that would have an effect on this? Wouldn't you have thought the same thing? <laughs> Not off the top of my head, no. I wouldn't have known what else to use. It's tr strictly by accident. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I don't mean to, to be coy about that. Uh, if we got, do we have two minutes? And I, I can explain it very quickly. Um, there was a study done at Brown University Medical School a few years ago that showed that patients that have movement disorders um, have a history of repeated or chronic strep infection. So I thought, well, those patients must have some problem with the strep still in their body or maybe something that cross-reacts. My big idea was that why don't we use a fraction of the strep organism and treat those movement disorders just for fun. So I asked some of the physicians in our group if they had any such patients. One had a, a patient like that that had a horrible tick to the head, like this. And if you sat with that patient in two minutes, you'd be going like this too. And that patient was asked if she would be willing to take this product that we had experimentally uh, that we thought might help her tick. And uh, we were confident it would be safe. We had no idea if it would have any biological effect. And she, being a nice lady, agreed to do it. And she came back four weeks later, uh, and the tick was re remarkably reduced but not eliminated. But the attending physician said, did you see anything else good or bad happen? And she about punched him and said, yeah, look at that. And he said, well, yeah, nice hand, what about it? And he, she said, well, she said, I'm 34 years old. When I was nine years old, I pulled a saucepan of boiling water off my mother's stove, and it went over my hands and scarred my knuckles, and the scars are all gone. That's how we found it. Okay, good. And I just want to go on record as saying animal models are cruel and terrible, and hopefully the FDA will change and you won't have to do that. Good luck, I'm all with you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> with respect to the, to the mechanism, I know you can't speak to this in the, in the human model, but with the rat model. So are you suggesting that the reduced inflammation is facilitating synap synaptogenesis, which is kind of helping the overall connectivity, or? No, we're looking more that gliosis, the scarring, is interfering with normal transmission of messages from cell to cell. That's it. And same thing with the chronic situation. So if we can either prevent that tissue, the scar interfering material from forming, or eliminate that which is already formed, the messages can get through, and away we go. We do not think we're doing anything to induce neuronal growth or anything of that sort. Yeah. Well, but synaptogenesis is just the connection between neurons. Not I think we're clearing that by getting rid of some of this damage caused by the inflammation. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm excited about this because my uh, cousin's daughter just got involved in, in, in one of those accidents. Mm -hmm. and, um, but uh, as a massage therapist, I notice I work with a lot of people with a chronic TBI, and the back of the head and the muscles here and the collagen and is all seems to be part of it and constricting on the cranial nerves just because of the muscle thing. And have you looked at that in terms of that? Um, you know, we, we haven't. But since we know that the SLO works on those kinds of scars also, 
that might very well be a component to the recovery we're seeing. And I look forward to the microglial aspect, too. That seems very important. Oh. I have several questions. Number one, uh, but first I want to state, I think it's great you're working on this. And um, because I have a friend who lost his son to suicide because of this. Uh, are you going to do, I understand you're going to do imaging. Are you going to do QEEGs as well? Whatever we have funds for. Okay. There's a lot to be done. And is there an uh, age limit to how young you will give this to somebody? Well, there might be. The youngest we've ever given is about six weeks of age. And that okay. was without any problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I, I must have missed this. Did, is this an ongoing treatment, like for 200 days? Or well, is it there's no, no set limit. Until the person plateaus and gets tired of taking drops, they keep taking them. Oh, so so it, it, once healing has occurred, there's no reason to think they're going to relapse with scars. But uh, the clinical trial will be a 90-day trial. But uh, this one patient, as you can see, is going close to a year now. And we have other patients that have gone as many as four years, some of the old football players. Continuing the same treatment? Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah although usually after a few months, uh, they don't hit four times a day. They might hit one in the morning and one in the evening, something like that. Right on time. Listen Thank you very much. Paper. Big round of applause.